G'day, Patrick. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bill. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you are so welcome. I am so excited to have you on the show after um, chatting with you briefly uh, some days ago and getting to know a little bit about what you do. This particular topic is really, really important and people that uh, have loved ones that are experiencing uh, a difficulty in life uh, from with regards to the, their health uh, really need to have the opportunity to hear what it is that you're going to share with us today. And uh, the topic is intensive care. And before we get stuck into the topic and have a real deeper talk about what it is that happens in intensive care, can you give us a little bit of information about how it is that you got involved in intensive care and uh, what it is that you did prior to getting to this point? Yeah. So, uh, again, Bill, thanks for inviting me to your show. I really appreciate it. So, as you've said, I'm an intensive care nurse by background, and I did my nurse training starting starting in 1996. I was a car mechanic prior to that, um, you know, and I wasn't, you know, I was only like 19 at the time, and I wasn't thought, well, do I want to be a car mechanic for the rest of my life? And the answer was no. So, I was looking for other options, and I ended up doing a little bit of work in a psychiatric hospital. And, you know, I really enjoyed that. And I thought, hmm, I think I really want to work with people in the future and I want to help them. And that's how I decided to become a nurse. So did my nurse training. And after I finished my nurse training, I, uh, you know, thought, what do I want to do now with my nurse training? And I decided I wanted to go into intense. I really enjoyed two stints in ICU during my nurse training. And I really enjoyed working with really critically ill patients and their families. And I also enjoyed the technology side of things. You know, there's a lot of machinery in ICU and all of that. So, you know, I enjoyed both. Um, worked a couple of years in ICU in a big teaching hospital in Munich in Germany, which is where I'm from originally and where I did my nurse training. And then worked in, in ICU for a couple of years. And then I joined a startup healthcare company in Germany called, um, you know, like a home ventilation service, also known as intensive care at home. We were basically the first service provider in Germany looking after patients on life support at home, right? And that was pretty crazy at the time. People thought it was crazy, but, you know, we were doing it anyway. And, uh, you know, after a couple of years, I then went overseas, worked in the UK as an intensive care nurse, did my critical care training there. And then in, in realized in the UK, there is no intensive care at home services for, for patients on life support. They, they're stuck in ICU or they die. There were no services offered in the community. I came to Australia in 2005. Again, I worked as an intensive care nurse in a number of hospitals. And I realized, again, there are no intensive care at home services in Australia for patients on life support. Um, and, you know, I was working in many hospitals. I worked as a nurse unit manager for five years in intensive care. And, you know, I eventually decided, well, something's got to be done about intensive care at home because it was a growing industry in Germany and people were leaving intensive care and mm -hmm. could go home on life support. And I just thought, well, there is absolutely no reason why it can't happen here. And that's when I eventually in 2012 started my own company, Intensive Care at Home, only to find that nobody was interested in it. And people thought it was crazy to provide intensive care at home. They didn't really understand what was happening in other countries. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of frustration initially when I started my company, realizing, oh, people have no idea what this means and how it can improve people's lives. What kind of person yeah. does unfortunately yeah. have to end up or well, fortunately end up in yeah. intensive care because if it didn't exist, well, maybe they wouldn't have the opportunity to be alive. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. And, and um, you know, you, you were saying, you know, it's fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you want to look at it. But the reality is intensive care is actually a really new specialty. You know, it only started out, I believe, in the late 1950s, early 1960s. If you think about it, that's not a long time. That's 50 years, Right. It's not a very long time. So it's a really new specialty, if you will, in, in the medical field. So who ends up in intensive care? Most intensive care units or big intensive care units have a number of specialty within the intensive care. And that usually starts with trauma. So anybody involved in severe motor vehicle accidents, people falling off roofs, bike accidents, ski accidents, whatever, you know, sport mm. injuries, head trauma, 
you know, those are people who end up in, in a trauma intensive care. Then you have the general section where people go, you know, after stroke, we, and I'm sure we talk about that in more depth later. Mm. Um, you know, people talk, uh, people come to, to general intensive care, maybe with burns, maybe with a pneumonia, maybe after abdominal surgery, yeah. after aortic aneurysms, mm. you name it. Right. The 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 um the other specialty in intensive care is cardiac, basically anything related to the heart. Okay, so people come there after open heart surgery. They come there after they sustain a heart attack, cardiac arrest, um, cardiomyopathy. Yeah. You know, you name it. Other specialties are pediatric intensive care children, uh-huh. and another sort of. Yeah, absolutely. And and I can talk about that too. I've worked in pediatric intensive care too. Um, And we're doing a number of pediatric work with our intensive care at home as well. Um, So we have a number of pediatric clients. Excuse me. Other specialties are neurotrauma. That's only specializing on head trauma. Um, And other specialties are like transplant, heart transplant, liver transplant, kidney transplant, Mm -hmm. lung transplant. So that's it in a nutshell. Those are people who go into intensive care. But the commonalities they all have, whether they go into trauma ICU, general ICU, cardiac ICU, the commonalities they all have, they are critically ill. They need life support most of the time intermittently, and their life is in danger. Right. Okay. Right. Those are the commonalities. So the machine is designed to keep them alive? Very much so. It's not only machines, it's also medications that are classified as life support. Mm -hmm. So you have the machinery like mechanical ventilation or like a dialysis machine for kidney failure. But you also have medications, for example, like inotropes. And again, I don't want to get too technical here that maintain a physiological blood pressure because many people who are critically ill can't maintain a blood pressure that's keeping them alive. So there's medications that can keep people's blood pressure above a physiological level and keep them alive. So there's a number of life support mechanisms, and that includes machinery Mm. as well as medications. Wow, that's a surprise. That's something I never would have realized. I mean, um, you hear about intensive care, and most of the things that we see on TV are, well, we have to switch the machine off now. And that's kind of how people in the – in the non-medical world, associate intensive care to a machine that's circulating the blood or keeping the heart pumping or keeping the lungs inflated, yeah? And that's part of it too, you know. There's now the latest sort of developments in intensive care, if you will, is ECMO. And again, I don't want to get too technical here, but ECMO is basically a bypass machine used in intensive care for heart failure and for lung failure. Basically, an ECMO machine can... um, can replace the function of the heart or the lung for a, a period of time until other solutions might come up, okay. right? And that heart transplant or a lung transplant, or it could just be the recovery of those organs, right? So, so there's a number of options in some intensive care units. So is intensive care something that I get to decide about as a loved one of somebody in intensive care, or is it something that the hospital just decides is going to happen? So somebody comes in, there's a trauma. How do people end up in intensive care? They have all these challenges, but is everyone eligible or does all the injuries make it possible for people to be in intensive care or not? Yeah, so that's a good question. Let's let's just run through an example, right, to illustrate that. Let's just say somebody is in a motor vehicle accident and, you know, Somebody witnesses an accident and they call the paramedics, they call the ambulance and the ambulance arrives and the patient they find is unconscious. Okay. Uh, When they see the patient is unconscious and potentially doesn't breathe, can't open their eyes, there's a very good chance they uh, start life support at the scene. Okay that automatically gets a patient in intensive care. If they need to start life support with a ventilator at the scene, if they need to put in a breathing tube, there is no other way but this patient will go into intensive care. The same applies, for example, if somebody has open heart surgery, even though it might be scheduled, okay, a patient after open heart surgery can't come off life support straight away because of the uh, 
because of the um, com complexity of such surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they know that a patient can't, after open heart surgery, can't come off life support straight away. So that qualifies for them to go into intensive care. There's no other place for them to go. Yeah, right. So, you know, but there are, you are, you are, but you are right that some patients might present to the emergency department or emergency room and somebody, you know, when the doctors and the nurses assess a patient, they might say, hmm, does this patient need to go into intensive care or not? Right. There's always a gray area. You would look at criteria like, you know, what are a patient's vital signs? Mm. What are their blood results? What are what does their chest X-ray look like? What does the CT scan show? You know, what interventions do we need down the line? Do they need a central line? Do they need an arterial line? Again, I don't want to get too technical mm. here, but there are a number of interventions that can only be done and then also monitored in intensive care. Mm, okay. So the work that you do at the moment, you're not making these types of decisions. You're dealing with people who are already in intensive care. Is that right? Yeah. So I do a couple of things at the moment, just, just to illustrate that to our listeners. So as I said, I started my own nursing service intensive care at home in 2012, only to realize I'm not getting any traction, couldn't get any funding through hospitals. They all thought it was crazy and that I was out of my mind and all of that. So then I, I thought to myself, what else do I need to do to educate people around this? And that's, that's when I came up with uh, another business idea. And I thought, let's start a resource and and support website for families in intensive care. And that's when I started another business and the name is Intensive Care Hotline, right? So we help families in intensive care to deal with the stress, to educate them, to help them asking the right questions, to make sense out of what is a quote unquote crazy situations for families in intensive care. Of course it is, right? So, and I started educating people there Initially, not not knowing how I could monetize this, it wasn't my main goal in the beginning. I just thought this is one vehicle how I can educate people also about intensive care at home, that if certain things happen in intensive care, there's always the option to go home, mm -hmm. even on life support. Uh, but then I realized very quickly, OK, well, people want to know about this and, and the business grew. And, and I started monetizing this by basically offering paid advice and consulting and advocacy. So somebody has a loved one in intensive care and for some reason something happens and they decide that they're not dealing with it or they're not understanding or they, they don't have any information. How do they come across? How do they move from out of the hospital to that? Because the way I see it is if I was involved, thank God I have never been involved with some, one of my loved ones in intensive care, I, I would seek all the information that I needed from the hospital because I see them as being the place where it's being supplied and provided. But also I would expect that that's where the expertise is. So how, what happens when somebody yeah. says, I can't, uh, I, I'm not getting what I want and, and I need to go somewhere yeah. else. Like, I don't yeah. understand. Fantastic question. Fantastic question. And it comes and, and that's really the crux of the question. And, and, you know, I will give you the answer. So, <laughs> excuse me. When I was nursing at the bedside in intensive care, right, um, I, I really enjoyed my time in intensive care. I had a great time. I, you know, made a lot of differences to people's lives and all of that. But there has also been, as time went on, there has also been an increasing frustration on my behalf because, um, you know, as you work in intensive care for nearly 20 years, you also know all the bullshit that's happening. Excuse my language, but, you know, you learn all the bullshit as well. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what families get told, but you also know what is true and what is not true of what they're getting told. Right. Okay. And I understand, you know, families need to be managed in intensive care. Patients need to be managed. And I get all of that, you know, and, and sometimes they simply don't understand what's really happening. But that's besides the point. I, I do believe that as intensive care professionals, whether doctors or nurses, um, we have a, a duty to educate people to the best of our abilities. Um, but to illustrate this further, there have been many situations in intensive care, especially when I was nursing at the bedside, but also as a nurse manager in intensive care, where I felt compromised in my ethics, even in my 
in my duty to report to the nurses board, right? Because I don't, my, my first my first report is always to the nursing board and not to a hospital, to an, to an em, employer, if you will. Mm. I'm a registered nurse. I report to the authorities, really, about my practice. To, to give you an example, I come on to a night shift one day and I look after a 62-year-old man who fell off the roof of his house, okay, and he fell on his head and, um, you know, he was probably dying, but we weren't quite sure yet. You know, his, his, his head injuries were really significant. He had high brain pressures and whatnot. So we knew it was pretty critical and, you know, we, we weren't sure would he survive the next 24, 48, 72, 72 96 hours. Mm -hmm. So I had a very unstable night on that night shift. You know, we managed to get the patient through the night and I was on again the next night. So I did two night shifts in a row and, you know, looked after the same patient. So when I come on the next night, um, you know, the doctors were just in, in the room and they said, oh, by 10 o'clock tonight, you're going to remove life support, right? And because I looked after the patient the night before, I knew the family, you know, and my first response to the doctor, if you want to remove life support, you can do it yourself because I won't. And he says to me, oh, are you refusing my orders? And I said, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Right. So and I said to him again, if you want to remove life support at 10 o'clock, you can do that. But I'm not doing it. And if you think that's the right thing to do, that's fine. But I'm, I'm either going home or I went to the nurse in charge and I said, look, I'm either going home or you reallocate me to another patient because he's basically asking me to kill a patient. I feel like I'm executing a patient here. Right. And having worked in intensive care at that stage for 15 years, they needed the bed. So, right, and they were telling. Let's go back yeah. for a second. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that, that's a pretty big deal, right? Somebody has asked you yeah. to remove life support from somebody that is ultimately going to end that yeah. life. Now, I understand yeah. what you're saying. It makes you feel like you're going to execute that particular patient because of the difference in opinion as to where you believe the patient is at and where the doctor believes and what the doctor's priorities are as opposed to what your priorities are. So what That's are right. your priorities as a nurse and what are the doctor's yeah. priorities? Yeah. So I don't think it's some some it's I don't think it's so much the doctor's priority or the nurse's priority. I think in that instance in particular, I tell you what it was. It was that it was a really senior doctor and he was managing the unit. He needed a bed. Right? He needed to free up that bed for the next patient. My duty as a nurse is looking at it from a holistic perspective, and the holistic perspective to me is the family, is the patient, and I'm the advocate. And the, there was no question in my mind that this patient would die, but the family wasn't ready for that. And that's not how you, um, how you orchestrate palliative care, yeah. right? End of life is fine. I have no problem with people dying in intensive care. I've seen it hundreds of times. I have no problem around that. I know it's happening, but there are ways to do it. Uh -huh. And that and that includes giving people an option to to intensive care at home, for example, right? So not giving people options and saying, oh yeah, we're going to remove life support by ten o'clock, and we told the family already. Yes, they have told the family, but the family said, no, you're not. So there was a huge conflict, right? right okay. And right and and as I said, in the end, the the patient passed away, but. Number one, not on my shift. Number two, the family was given more time because they were waiting for people to come in from overseas, brothers and sisters and whatnot. You know, as I said, from, from a nursing perspective or even from anybody's perspective, it's about a holistic picture. And the holistic picture is the family as well. So it's a holistic approach that we're talking about here. So I really appreciate what you said. You, What you're interested in is not necessarily whether the patient is going to pass or, or survive. But obviously we want the patient to, to survive if it's possible. But if it's not possible, what we want to do is provide enough time for loved ones, enough time for the family to be able to gather and make the decision in their own way. Now, the challenge with that though, Patrick is a doctor, and I'm not a doctor, but maybe the doctor's thinking, but if we don't make a bed available, there's another person that can't come into intensive care and as a result that person may not make it 
that that is correct. And I'm, look, I'm well aware of the pressures in intensive care. I have mm. managed two intensive care units when I worked in hospital. Mm. So I'm, you know, I was responsible for ICU beds for the staff. Mm. I'm well aware of the pressures, right? Uh, but that was also one of the reasons why I didn't want to work as a manager anymore, because I just felt this is not why I went into nursing, oh, no. right? Right. I went into nursing to provide care to a patient and to a family. And that to me includes, you know, uh, providing end of life care that includes the family in decision making. And it includes, you know, the cultural, the spiritual, the, um, you know, the history of a patient. It includes so much. Yeah, right. Right. And and that's where I believe, yes, I'm well aware of the pressures and but at the end of the day, this is a life. And on the and what's also playing into that as well is there are a number of patients in intensive care, and not the example that I've given you, but there are patients in intensive care where life support gets stopped or withdrawn prematurely. And I argue, well, if you continue to treat this patient, maybe they would have survived. Right. To illustrate that with some numbers, more than 90% of intensive care patients leave intensive care alive. Wow. Okay, so the vast, wow. the vast majority of patients in intensive care survive. So, again, I have been exposed and been part of hundreds of end-of-life situations. I'm not disputing the fact that patients are dying, not at all. But there are ways how to provide end-of-life care. And we are providing palliative care at home with intensive care at home for people on life support. And again, that's not for everyone, but people need to be given an option. Yeah, okay, let's talk about that. Uh, so tell me, how does somebody transition from intensive care in the hospital to intensive care at home? How does that process happen? Yeah. And yeah. now, is it readily available in Australia? Yeah. So how does some, let's, let's just quickly talk about What's the um, the category, if you will, you know? So I talked earlier about trauma ICU. I talked about general ICU. I talked about um, cardiac ICU, pediatrics. I almost believe we are carving out a fifth option with intensive care at home, right? Who Who can go home? It's patients who need life support, but who are medically stable. Okay, what does that mean? It means they have medical issues that need to be managed with life support, mainly ventilation. But other things like inotropes, for example, they have a, a stable blood pressure most of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it, it, and it doesn't really, some patients that go home on life support are conscious, some are uncon unconscious, but most of them would be conscious. Okay. Um, how do they transition and is it really readily available? Look, um, as when I first started out with intensive care at home, it was basically myself going into a person's home on life support. That's how I started. And as the demand grew, I hired staff. But, but okay. go, going into the home of a person who's on life support, how did they come out of the hospital? Who made the decision yeah. to send them home on life support? Yeah. And, yeah. and when I'm thinking of life support, are we talking to that patient? Is that patient responding or are they just yeah. lying down? Yeah, yeah. A very good question. It really depends. You know, I, I take this example, you know, the very first client that we worked with in the home where I started with doing some shifts there, he was a, a guy in his mid thirties. He was, he's quadriplegic. He's a C1 uh, spinal injury. Um, and that happened at, at his, at his age of six, he was in an accident. Okay. Um, and that was in the early 1980s. Now this, this guy in particular can talk, you know, he's fully compass mentors. And the stories he's telling me are not dissimilar to my stories that I experienced in intensive care. In intensive care, if it hadn't been for his parents, they would have stopped life support. Right? So it was the parents at the time who said, no, you're not going to stop life support. We want our child to live. Right? And they took their own responsibility then to take him home. Services. Right? But... Um, you know, the, the, the reality is there is a market for intensive care at home, and that market would even be bigger if people in intensive care thought there is a perceived alternative for somebody on life support that they think is not getting any better. 
right? Again, I'm not disputing that some patients don't want to go home on life support. That's fine, but people need to be given a choice. Yeah, okay. So now we have the option where in a hospital, if the hospital makes a decision like we're going to reduce, we're going to stop life support, is it something that a patient, a patient's family, carers, et cetera, can request not to stop it and transfer it to yeah. life support at home? Yeah. That's a very good question. Uh, that's one, one thing we're trying to achieve with intensive care hotline as well as intensive care at home. We're trying to educate people constantly on their rights. Okay. So we're both in Melbourne, in Victoria, you know, and, and states differ with their laws and regulation. Mm -hmm. And with my intensive care hotline, I do things all over the world. So I have a very good idea, especially what's happening in the US, in the UK, as well as Australia, in terms of, you know, people's rights and so forth. Um, in Victoria, for example, because we're both in Melbourne, the law at the moment is, uh, it's not crystal clear, but at the moment it's slightly in favor of a hospital or doctor that they can make that decision. However, the law is changing as early as March next year, March 2018. The law in Victoria is changing and uh, life support cannot be removed without consent of either a patient or their medical power of attorney. Right, okay. okay, so this will be this will be huge, and uh, the medical profession I know already they won't like that because that's how they manage their ICU beds, quite frankly, or how they manage some of their ICU beds. Mm. Um, whereas I see it, you know, from my perspective, I see it as a huge step. People will have more choice, and people will also demand will be more demanding about having options like intensive care at home. Um, and we're doing that already, you know, we, with intensive care hotline, uh, pushed, put pressure on the system, right? And we have clients here in Melbourne that say that hire us for consulting in intensive care, and they go back to the ICU and they say to the doctors, "Hey, if my mum or my dad can't come off the ventilator, we want intensive care at home." Okay, so that right. does achieve the job of freeing up a bed. That allows Absolutely. the hospital to have the bed free for another patient coming in, great. And it allows that person to be cared for at home so that people don't have to travel to hospital, pay for parking, do all the stuff that's associated with being uh, in a hospital, which is really difficult for people. Um, and when that person is at home, who is funding that ICU yeah. at home? Yeah, very good question, Bill. Um, we have a variety of funding sources. Um, and I, I don't want to really publicly disclose that, but, you know, we get funding through, let's just call it insurance companies. Yeah. We also get government funding and we get funding through hospitals directly. Okay, but it it took a long time, right? Yeah. It, it went from this guy is crazy to we're now getting funding and we're providing intensive care at home and we've done enough work to prove the concept. Yeah. So the concept right. was well uh, was up and running in other countries, though, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. But as you know, you know, if you know, some people might feel, um, you know, if I haven't invented it, it's sort of it doesn't exist, right? And I had even people, you know, when I first went out to hospitals and tried to market the service, I had some people tell me, "Oh, don't waste your time. You're not in Europe, right?" Yeah, right. And um, I just went like, okay, well, that's what you think, but I'm not – just because you you think I should be giving up, I'm not. <laughs> um, so tell me from the perspective of your fellow nurses, how are they talking about this service? Or how do they sort of respond to this type of service? What are they yeah. saying? Yeah. Look, my when I you know when I started this, I was still working in ICU because I needed an income, right? So we're still working in ICU full time, trying to get this off the ground. And you know, um, sort of most people thought it was crazy, and this guy is crazy. He just thinks you know he can do something that nobody has done before, and you know, just yeah, this guy he's just a bit nuts, and you know, that's okay. It just doesn't really matter what other people thought. Um, obviously, now that I've that we are operating, I hire ICU nurses, mm. um, and I do believe that I attract a certain kind of ICU nurse that is really passionate about this area of work, mm. and I can describe that ICU nurse to you because that's very. I tell you, my best ICU nurses that I have now in my business are 
an ICU nurse who has worked in ICU for more than 20 years. They are frustrated by the system. They have been bullied. And they don't feel appreciated in a public or in a private hospital. Mm -hmm. And they want to use their skills that they've learned over decades to make a difference to a patient and to a family in a much more friendly environment. They are my best performers. They get it. And they don't want to go back into hospital. They know we have to make it work. So what are some of the, what's some of the feedback that you're getting from carers, families, friends? What are they telling yeah, you? Yeah. Um, families, you know, they say good things about us because we get referral through, referrals through families. Right. Okay, that's, you know, word of mouth. How's it um, changing their lives? How's it making their lives better? Yeah. So I, I give you I give you an example, okay? So if you have somebody at home on life support and you have no one to look after your child, your spouse, whoever the person might be, basically the, their life stops completely. Mm. They ca often can't produce an income, right? They are awake at night because they care for a loved one on life support, right? right? Or, or in, in another instance, they're still in ICU, a night in ICU, pay for parking, travel, depending on where they are, right? So the, the impact is huge. But you also mentioned earlier, and I want to hone in on that very briefly too, you mentioned earlier it's uh, emptying, you know, it's freeing up the ICU, but it's not only doing that, it's costing half of the money. Oh, yeah. So an ICU bed is five to six five to six thousand dollars per bed day 24 hours in icu costs around five to six thousand dollars so we do intensive care at home for less than half of for less than 50 percent wow. of the cost so it's a win-win wow so all of the equipment that's necessary to sustain life keep somebody going all the things that you do in a hospital is it just the same equipment is it just as good at home as it is in hospital uh, look uh, it's, it might be, some people might think, oh, it's not quite as fancy as in a hospital, but it's definitely doing the job. It's definitely keeping people alive, you know, and, and I, I, re, I refer to this to our very first patient, you know, that we had for intensive care at home, home on life support for 30 plus years. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Right. So. It is amazing. So technology is one side of things, and it's important. But people's mindset, yeah. people's will to live, people making arrangements to make it happen is way more important. Or well, it's fifty percent of the equation, if you will. Yeah, well, that's pretty amazing. Um, so, is there a twenty-four hour, seven-day-a-week nurse in shifts attending that person yeah. with uh, intensive care so, at home? Yeah, we have provided twenty-four hour care. I'll tell you. I'll give you a real case study at the moment we were looking after a toddler at home on life support a 20 month old toddler and we're dealing with the authorities and the authorities threaten us as a service provider to take funding away for you know they think it's too expensive blah 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 um and you know we were almost fighting daily battles to maintain the funding and basically and at the end keep the toddler alive right, right? so uh, there are many people out there in this world who would like to see us go out of business rather sooner than later. I know that. And that's including some government authorities, you know, because we are, I believe, we are revolutionizing the space. We are challenging the space. And, um, you know, we, we move heaven and earth to advocate for our patients and for our families. Yeah. It sounds like um, for the first time, maybe in a long time, the people that are caring or and the families have got somebody on their side really doing a task that somebody's going to do, but often the carers and the families don't know to do it and don't know how to do it right. Is it possible? Right. Is it possible? It's, it's, it sounds like it's possible for people to come off life support too soon, but is it possible to leave people on life support too long? It definitely yes. Definitely yes. Um, I have seen that too, right, where people were suffering because they were on life support too long and um, you know, where probably life support should have switched off. But you see, one of the biggest problems that I can see is 
um, even though intensive care professionals are exposed to death and dying on a day-by-day -day basis, I do believe they are very poor communicators when it comes to it. Okay, one part of my my business, especially with intensive care hotline, I do a lot of bereavement counseling. Okay, I do believe I have the skill to help people in end of life situations to come to terms with it if it's inevitable. Right? Because I've seen it many times. So yes, the answer to your question definitely yes. There there are patients who are on life support for too long, especially if they're suffering and end of life is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Okay? That that's definitely happening too. But I do believe the number of people that uh, where life support is stopped prematurely is higher. Right. Fair enough. Well, in my community, in the stroke community, I imagine a lot of the people that are listening who know somebody who's had a stroke or who have experienced a stroke or who are caring for somebody who experienced a stroke, their, that, their loved one would have gone, very likely a lot of people experiencing stroke would have gone through an intensive care, uh, a period of time in intensive care. What can we advise people to do to make sure that they're getting the best result for the patient, their loved one, their family member, while they are in the intensive care process? What can yeah. we advise yeah. them to do? How, how do they go yeah. about managing that process? Yeah, fantastic question, fantastic question. So when patients get admitted to intensive care, and they're really critically ill, you know, I'm not talking about an overnight stay, you know, some patients go into intensive care just for a night for monitoring, they're not on life support, it's just maybe, you know, what might be referred to as a medical emergency. I'm not talking about those patients, I'm really talking about a critically ill patient that's fighting for their lives. That's the example that I'm trying to illustrate. And let's take a stroke patient, because I know you're, you're a stroke survivor and your community of listeners will be very interested in this topic. Somebody coming into intensive care with a stroke, they're coming to intensive care, they stop breathing during the stroke, they need mechanical ventilation, they have had a CAT scan, right, a CT scan, they might have had an MRI scan, you know, it shows some brain damage, you know, and patients now on life support and it's not quote unquote waking up. Yeah. Okay. So the um, and and if your listeners either have been in intensive care or have a family member in intensive care, the the with with our intensive care hotline, the number one question we get is how long does it take to wake up after induced coma? That's the number one question we get. Uh -huh. Okay, the answer to to that question is it depends, and it can take weeks. Okay. So now you're coming into intensive care with a stroke, so you have some neurological damage and you are induced into a coma, okay? And people ask, well, how long does it take to wake up after a stroke? And the answer is, it depends, okay? So after three or four days in intensive care, the ICU is getting nervous, you know, patient with stroke is not waking up, it's unstable. The worst case scenario for an intensive care unit is to look after a patient indefinitely with an uncertain outcome. That's the worst case scenario for an intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after three or four days of treatment, nothing's happening, you know, not moving forward, not moving backwards. Maybe the patient's getting an infection now because of ventilation. So the family get families often then get pulled into a, what's called a family meeting and they get told, look, your mom's not waking up, your dad's not waking up. They had a severe stroke. MRI looks pretty bad, CT scan is looking pretty bad. We think it's, quote unquote, in the best interest to stop life support because your family member won't have any quality of life in the future, you know. And that's after three or four days. Yeah, right. Right? The ICU is under pressure. They need the bed. They don't want to look after patients indefinitely with an uncertain outcome. So my advice to a family in, in such a situation is co communicate to the intensive care team what they want and not back off from that, because otherwise they will walk all over them. I know I'm, I'm speaking harsh words here, mm. but that's just what I've seen. Okay, so as, right. a, as a patient, carer, family member, loved one, we've got the right to say, this is what I want, and you have to comply to what I want. Oh. And under those conditions, can the hospital make the alternative decision after three or four days? Can they say, well, sorry, we... We don't agree with you. We're going to switch it up. Can they do that or not? 
they could in theory, but it happens rarely, especially if, if families are doing their own research and, you know, they they are moving, prepared to move heaven and earth to not let it happen. And more families are heading that way that, you know, they are getting more assertive. They're doing their own research, you know. So, yes, the law in Victoria is still in slight favor of the um, of the hospitals. Oh. But at the day, but at the end of the day, the last thing a hospital wants is to get sued or get into the papers, you know. And as you know, Bill, everything in life is negotiable. I'm a yeah. big believer in that, yeah. right? So um, what I also refer to, I have a blog post on my website that's, you know, a lot of people read. And it's a, it, the title is something like, is your loved one in intensive care in a real or in a perceived end of life situation? Uh -huh. Right? A real end of life situation is nothing can stop your, your loved one from dying in intensive care. There's no life saving device, no surgery, no drug that can save your loved one from, from dying. Uh -huh. End of life situation. A perceived end of life situation is where the ICU team says to you as a family member or to a patient, even if they're awake, look, we think it's quote unquote in your best interest to let you die. Okay? That is a perceived end of life situation. Right. But it's the it's a perception of a doctor maybe. Well, we think you don't have any quality of life, and therefore you should die. Okay. What's quality? What what is quality of life? Is it's, it's a subjective experience. Right. Anybody to judge. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So there are definite opportunities for a doctor to make a decision because there's no other alternative outcome. That's it. The patient's going to pass. There's no That's other right. outcome. We can even ask for a little bit of time to be with that patient for a little bit longer. Just to make us feel a little bit better so we can get the family around we can do all yeah. of that stuff and we can accept it in our own way and we, we can enable the process to then take place to occur right but in a situation right. where you feel like it's just a difference of opinion sure it's an opinion of a doctor a well-educated doctor somebody who knows a lot of things about the challenges that the patient might be dealing with still we have the opportunity to say hang on a sec now we want to question with all due respect your opinion we don't we have a different opinion and we want more time and we will also want to take up the opportunity or consider the possibility of doing an at-home intensive care program correct correct it's really all about giving people choice so this is a topic that uh, this interview has been a little bit heavy I feel like it's been a little bit heavy because we're talking about a really serious situation yeah Yep. Yeah, you see, it's interesting. For you, it's heavy. For me, it's bread and butter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm desensitized to a degree, yeah. um, you know, but not, not desensitized to not care. You know, it's just, I, how can I, how can I, you know, people say you asked earlier, how do friends respond, you know, a family or whatever. Um, you know, a fish, a fish in water doesn't know what water is, right? And I feel like when I go into intensive care, it's like, well, it's, it's what I do. Yeah, I get I, it. I, you know, I have my own opinion about it, and they, some people might think, oh, he has a really strong opinion about it, yeah. but I could never imagine doing something different. I could never imagine. I'm drawn to this like a fly to the, to the light, you know. Look, I, it's I, really I, great that you're doing it, and it's really great that you have a different opinion and that you've had the courage to share that and to make a difference because without somebody taking a different approach, nothing would ever be invented. Without somebody bucking the trend or – you know, challenging people, nothing would ever happen. So I'm glad that you've done it. And I think you've done it in one of the best parts of the medical system that you could possibly do that, which is at that moment where a loved one's about to lose their loved one, you know, where somebody's about to lose their loved one. I mean, that's really important that somebody has an advocate, somebody by their side and is able to support them when loved ones and people that are going through a tough time of people that are suffering in hospital are probably not in the right frame of mind to make decisions correctly, yeah? They're not. They're running high on emotions. The um, you know, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what to look for, mm. right? And you know, they're not in the right frame of mind to make a rational decision. Yeah. And how could you? How could you? No matter how prepared you are, you mm. aren't. No way. You wouldn't you want know. anyone to be prepared for something like that. That means they've gone through it too many times. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, 
and, and the other thing, yes, now now I now I, I remember what I wanted to say, which I think is really important for uh, for our listeners. So I mentioned to you earlier, ninety percent of patients in intensive care survive intensive care. Okay, and especially when it comes to end of life situations, discussions around withdrawal of treatment, stopping life support, and all of that. Right. One thing that I one thing where I believe intensive care professionals are falling short, including myself, is we don't know what a patient's life looks like when they leave intensive care. We don't know what their life looks like in six months' time, in 12 months' time, in five years' time. We have no idea. Mm. And yet, a lot of doctors in particular claim, well, this patient won't have any quality of life. How do you know? Yeah. How do you know what a patient in a coma would want as quality of life? You can't even ask them. That's a big assumption that they make. I oh, know that's something similar happens in rehabilitation, right? So in rehab, when people go in and they are 75 years old, often they get the bare minimum amount of rehabilitation because they're considered too old. They're considered you know, to be at the end of their life. And it's a resource that maybe we should allocate to somebody who is more likely to yeah. be useful to the community, which is yeah. just crazy. It's crazy. If it was your loved one and you're making a decision on them, you wouldn't take away rehabilitation or any service you would offer them every possibility so that you could spend time with your loved one and they could get better and be whoever they need to be or pass away with the dignity that the family chooses correct correct and and also talking about dignity about end of life there is another big aspect surveys in australia as well as in other first world countries have shown that 75 percent of people would want to die at home if given the option and yet less than 15 percent actually do die at home that's one five yeah. so i believe it's about 50 percent of the population currently dies in hospitals you know and i know from nearly working in hospitals for 20 years they use the one size fits all approach yeah. right and again i believe there's just individuality is needed at the end of life as well yeah i think so too Let's end this on a positive note. Tell me about an amazing story of somebody that came into uh, intensive care and just walked out of the hospital, jumping up and down and being amazing. Yeah, yeah. i tell you a story. So it was in my early days in intensive care. We looked after a young man. He would have been in his late 20s. He was a carpenter and you know, he had a severe accident. Again, he fell off a, a roof or he fell off a scaffolding. I can't remember. He fell off something hit his head really badly, um, had a massive head injury and, you know, he was going into multi-organ failure. I remember we were really fighting for his life for weeks. He was on kidney dialysis. His kidneys were failing. And, you know, after many weeks of intensive care, um, he, he left intensive care, right? And, you know, went out of ICU, but probably wasn't conscious at that stage. And then about six months later, you know, he comes back to ICU as a visitor and says, hey, I'm such and such. I don't remember anything, but I do want to thank you all for saving my life. Wow. Yeah, wow. And you never forget that. You never. No. You never. Never. Yeah, beautiful story, mate. That's a great way to end the podcast. And before we go, where can somebody find you if they need to get in touch, if they Yeah. Need so help? take out. Yeah, thank you. Check out intensivecareathome.com or check out intensivecarehotline.com and you can always send an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Excellent. Patrick, I am so uh, grateful that we got the opportunity to uh, meet each other and have an opportunity to chat. I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussions in the future and I also have a feeling that unfortunately I'll probably be ringing you to say, look, I have somebody who needs some advice in this situation. Hopefully not, but hopefully, I'm here. Hopefully not, but I'm glad that you're there if that ever happens for um, anyone in my community. Um, thanks so much again. I really look forward to just keeping in touch and just um, I really support you. I hope that everything that you're aspiring you know, to achieve with the service and the, the, you know, and the way that you want to go about people having options and caring, I hope that comes to fruition and, and occurs in exactly the way that you envisage it. I think it's a great vision. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill. Thank well, I hope